Indeed, it is, you know, so important for us to take time to learn lessons um, from the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, to, to learn lessons about the lie and destruction of war and militarism. I was raised by a family that was very active in the anti-nuclear movement my whole life. We followed the words of Dr. King, who said that peace is not just the absence of tension, but the presence of, injust of justice. Uh, my family uh, taught me to listen to the Bible quote from Jeremiah, my people are broken, shattered, and yet they put on band-aids saying it's not so bad, you'll be just fine, but things are not just fine. Our leaders say peace, peace, when there is no peace. And this is surely the case in the year 2020, the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As folks know, 2020 began with a near war with Iran, the deadly upshot of a bomb first, ask questions later approach to world affairs. Then came this pandemic, a public health disaster made all the more lethal by our, the United States country's administration's utter indifference to the lives of the people, especially the poor and people of color. Then there were the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade and Armand Arbery and so many others, more names to the list of black lives that didn't matter to the US state. And then an eruption of righteous rage, even more police brutality in response. The lessons of these historic moments, months, is clear. Funneling trillions of dollars into institutions designed to violently protect the status quo, be they police or military, guns or bombs, does not make ourselves, our loved ones, our communities any safer. It's the lesson from the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki 75 years ago. In the United States, as demands to demilitarize the police and redistribute funds to programs of social uplift gain traction, we need to similarly reimagine our approach to national security and world affairs. To create real security, we must slash the Pentagon budget we must dismantle the war economy. We must stop the continued proliferation of atomic bombs and we in, must invest instead in meeting everybody's basic human needs. The US war making budget is well over $700 billion a year. That's more than the next 10 countries combined, 53 cents of every discretionary dollar in our federal budget. Just for a little bit of comparison, when Donald Trump tried to kick 700,000 poor people off of life-saving food stamps programs this past year, it was justified by an expected saving of $1 billion. Every dollar spent on feeding this war machine is a dollar not spent on housing. It's not spent on healthcare or education, on jobs, or on preventing pandemics. It's not spent on confronting the climate crisis, in a country that is beset by searing poverty, gaping inequality, and widespread environmental injustice, the overblown Pentagon budget is not just a case of mismatched priorities, but it's a war on the poor in the United States and across the world. The violent first approach to foreign and domestic policy does not address the root causes of conflict or unrest. It does not make the people of the United States safer and it certainly does not make the rest of the world safer. So at some point we must ask the question, who does this all serve? Nearly half of the money that flows into the Pentagon's overstuffed coffers goes straight to for-profit war corporations, corporations like Lockheed Martin, whose multi-million dollar lobbying spending is only matched by the excessive salaries of their top executives. Still more corporations plan to get rich off of post-invasion reorganization of different economies, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan, whether it's Yemen, 
And meanwhile, the politicians that serve their interests rally support through jingoist slogans, the scapegoating of foreigners. But in short, as the modern system of policing is used to suppress black, brown, and poor communities in order to protect private property and preserve existing hierarchy of the power, so does the war economy. This is all happening in a society where nearly half of the US population is poor or low income. There are 87 in uninsured and underinsured people in the United States, 62 million workers who make less than a living wage, 15 million families who can't afford water, and 4 million whose water is poisoned. There are upwards of 12 million homeless people in this, the richest country in the world. And although the United States does not have a military draft, we have a poverty draft where many young people have no potential of getting an education or stable employment without joining the military. Thousands of communities are contaminated by petrochemical companies, industrial waste and raw sewage, all made worse by climate change and the militarization and destruction of the earth. Using the US Census Bureau supplemental poverty measure, there are at least 140 million people who are poor or just one $400 emergency from poverty. These include family farmers who live in food des deserts with their rural hospitals closing, moms who have had to bury their children, not because they were called home by God, but because they have no health care. Teenagers whose homeless encampments have been bulldozed by the police and white supremacist militias. Native Americans whose sacred lands are being mined by multinational extractors. According to our Souls of Poor Folk Audit of America, the poor or low income today consist of 24 million Black people, 38 million Latinos, 8 million Asian Americans, 2 million Native peoples, and 66 million poor white people. These staggering numbers, already a dead weight for the nation, are starting to prove to be a grotesque underestimate in this coronavirus world. In the last few decades, unemployment, underemployment, poverty, and homelessness have become ever more deeply and permanently structured into United States society. Over the years, one political narrative has been trumpeted by both parties in the US is that we don't have enough to provide for everyone. But this scarcity argument has undergirded every federal budget in recent her history, and yet it falls flat when we look at the fact that 53% of every federal discretionary dollar goes to the Pentagon, that trillions of dollars have been squandered in this country's never ending wars, and not to speak of the unprecedented financial gains the wealthiest have made, even in the midst of this pandemic. What we've seen over the past months is that the US government has funneled trillions of dollars into the Wall Street and into corporations leaving still tens of millions of people completely left out of any stimulus. And months later now, we have moratoriums on evictions that are expiring, sending potentially 23 million people to, with eviction papers by September. Because the bailout has gone primarily to the rich and because of a failing public infrastructure and an administration that has failed to stop the pandemic, now the US military is infecting military bases across the world, including as folks I'm sure have heard in Okinawa. The crises and pandemics of poverty and racism and inequality and COVID-19 alongside war and the destruction of the earth are revealing ever more clearly now how the descent into poverty is helping to destroy American society from the inside out. But isn't it then time to demand a transformative moral agenda that reaches from the bottom up? 75 years after the whole scale destruction wrought by the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, isn't it time now for peace and for justice? If the US shrank our war economy, eliminating nuclear weapons and cutting US military bases in countries across the world, if we had a fair taxation system for the rich and corporations, if we forgave debts and invested in universal healthcare, living wages and a guaranteed income, decent and affordable housing, strong programs for the poor, we could indeed end poverty. We could indeed turn our war economy into a peace economy. 
This crisis is offering us a striking demonstration of how an economy oriented around the whims of the rich and the drums of war brings death and destruction everywhere in its wake. A society organized around the needs of the poor, on the other hand, could improve life for us all. And maybe in this moment, this is possible. This is why the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival is building power amongst those who are poor and marginalized and hurting. We've, we have an understanding that to address poverty, we must simultaneously address five interlocking injustices, systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and this distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. And we've seen in, in history that whenever we faced forces of regression, moral movements have arisen to call us to higher ground. In every generation, we've needed a fusion movement where people can come together through our deepest moral values to build an agenda, an agenda that promotes earth rights, immigrant rights, poor people's rights, women's rights, all human rights. But we know that just articulating this agenda isn't enough. We need activism and we need to disrupt the forces of injustice. There indeed is a moral uprising, a new and unsettling force of people who are refusing to give up refusing to settle and surrender to suffering, a force of people who believe in fusion, who are united by morals, who are crying out, somebody is hurting our people. It has gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. 2020 began with an almost war, then a pandemic, then more murders, but then came an uprising. As demands grow to redirect money away from the police and toward the building blocks of a more just, equitable society, we can do the same for this war economy. Our security will not come from the reach of a bomb, but from the voice of a movement. Hiroshima teaches us this, this. Minneapolis teaches us this. Nagasaki teaches us this. Louisville teaches us this. Let us learn and let us organize together. Thank you very much.